Okay, then I will say hi everyone and welcome to our May 2021 Albany Pine Bush Science Lecture. I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pine Bush Community Board uh, who co-sponsor with commission staff our monthly science lectures. Before we start today's program, Ants of Inland Massachusetts Barrens, two housekeeping notes. First, as questions occur to you during today's presentation, uh, we suggest you use the Q&A option at the bottom to type your question. Uh, Dylan will direct your questions to our speaker at the end, and uh, you can add them anytime you want or at the end, or you'll be monitoring. And second, uh, June 17th is our next science lecture. It's again, the third Thursday of the month, seven o'clock. And that will be assessing the status of Fisher in a managed fragmented suburban landscape in Albany, New York. Fisher populations uh, were once believed to only thrive in dense, remote, coniferous and mixed forest away from human inhabited areas, but they are gradually expanding across New York state. These medium sized carnivores are being sighted in suburban landscapes including the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. University at Albany graduate student Daniel Winters will speak about his research as he explores the status of the Fisher population in our area and I'll talk about how they utilize this unique habitat. Now, on to Dylan to introduce today's speaker. I'm very much looking forward to this. Dylan. All right, thank you so much, Richard. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker um, tonight, uh, Kyle Bradford. Kyle is currently a master's student um, at Antioch University of New England. Um, and he's gonna be presenting tonight on his master's work, um, looking at ants of inland barrens in Massachusetts. Um, he got his bachelor's degree at the University of Vermont in environmental science. Um, he is from New England. He grew up in Western Massachusetts. Um, and I think Kyle's going to give us a little background himself about uh, <laughs> how he got interested in ants. So Kyle, I will hand it over to you now. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. Um, thanks for inviting me to, to speak tonight. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming out and, and listening. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about ants of inland Massachusetts barrens. Um, my email is here and I'll also have it at the end if and feel free to reach out um, if you have additional questions or, or anything. Um, so first off, I want to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so I would like to acknowledge the native people who have and continue to steward the land on which I live and work including um, the Abenaki, Nipmuc, and Mohican people. So I live in southern Vermont, which is um, part of the traditional homelands of the Abenaki. And I, I did my research on Abenaki, Nipmuc, and Mohican um, uh, homelands. So this is just an outline of the talk tonight. Um, I'm going to split it up into two main sections. So there's going to be an introduction with some of my background, um, how I got interested in ants, and then some general ant biology, um, and then why ants are awesome. And then get into some of my thesis work on inland Massachusetts barrens, including what are barrens and some of our preliminary uh, results and findings. So my background, as, as Dylan mentioned, I, I got a bachelor's uh, in environmental science uh, from the University of Vermont. And I, I really didn't have an interest in insects. I was, of course, interested in the natural world, but I had kind of focused more on climate change, uh, sustainability, and got interested in agroecology, which is the ecology of agricultural systems. So I was interested in kind of human and, and nature interactions, um, in, including um, in agricultural systems. And that's um, kind of what kind of brought me to this program. And I was fortunate enough to um, work with the Hawthorne Valley Farmscape Ecology Program, um, first as an intern and then as a tech for a, um, a total of three years. And, and this, is, this program is located in Columbia County, uh, New York, just south of Albany, about 30 minutes. And we, um, my work there had to do with this project that, that was trying to describe habitat types um, in the county. And so we were looking at plants and a number of insect groups. And this was really my first 
deep dive into natural history um, and insects. And I got really hooked um, on the fascinating lives of, of insects. And I, and I quickly learned that um, by, by sampling um, ants and ground beetles and looking for uh, butterflies and dragonflies, I quickly learned, especially with the ant fauna, that we really don't know a whole lot. Um, it, it was a surprise to me. I thought surely we, we would have things like county lists of just what, what the biodiversity is, what the ant fauna uh, is in a specific area, but that just wasn't the case. Um, and we were, we were um, finding really interesting ants. Um, so for instance, we had this uh, Formica prociliata, which was a New York state record. Um, and we found it abundant in Columbia County uh, and it makes kind of conspicuous nests. Uh, it wasn't like it was hiding out in some um, obscure untouched area. It was nesting in kind of old fields uh, and it was really quite abundant in this one spot, but just no one had really uh, looked for it. Um, no one had kind of looked for ants in this area. So we were finding these all these interesting things. Uh, we had some uh, an ant here that was way south of its known distribution um, in uh, New England. It was mostly a boreal or a high high latitude ant. Um, and then a, a southern species that, that was a bit farther north than we, we would have expected. And, and another thing that I found out quickly was that from a lens, uh, looking through the lens of, of insect uh, conservation, um, I, I quickly learned that habitats like this were really important. Um, in New England, uh, um, you know, in a mostly forested landscape now, um, these kinds of open habitats, uh, human uh, disturbed habitats um, like this old field are becoming uh, less and less. We're losing our early successional habitat and we're losing the insect fauna um, and, and of course the, the other fauna the vertebrates and the and the plants that that um, depend on this type of habitat. Um, so I was really started to key in on on some of these uh, different human um, human uh, nature interactions um, and human um, influence habitats. So I came to Antioch. Um, I, I wanted to continue my studies uh, on ants, and I and I met uh, Mike Akresh, who became my my um, faculty advisor, and he had studied shrubland birds um, in uh, Pine Barrens uh, for over a decade. And so he, he kind of introduced me to um, uh, these kinds of systems, these Pine Barrens, uh, which are a human um, influence system. They depend on disturbance, and I'll get into a lot of that uh, later in this presentation. Um, but he was also keen on looking at insects. So he was interested in, in my uh, ant project. And, and so we, um, we started uh, on this project uh, along with Chris Bulow here. Um, he's the senior restoration ecologist at Mass uh, Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. Um, and he is, has, has a wealth of information on barrens. Um, he's, he's been spearheading um, quite a bit of this restoration work that I'm gonna talk about and he was um, critical in, in really um, uh, letting us know of, of particular sites that, that he knew of um, throughout central and western Massachusetts. So my, my thesis proposal ended up being effects of management and environmental variables on ant colony abundance and diversity in inland barrens of Massachusetts. So, now I'll get into some general ant biology. So just the basics, um, ants are part of this order Hymenoptera, which they share with the wasps and bees and sawflies. And ants evolved from wasp-like creatures some 150 million years ago. And ant, all ants are eusocial. So eusocialness is common in the Hymenoptera but, um, but it's, it's really um, really what makes the ants different than, than these other groups. So social, uh, you, we know of social wasps and bees, but that is actually um, kind of uh, 
it, it's not the what's most common in those groups. Most wasps and bees are actually solitary, but in the ants, they're all social. And so what this means is that they live in a colony. There's, there's multiple generations living together. They do uh, cooperative care of the young and there's different divisions of labor. So some ants are just working in the brood chamber, kind of um, helping the, the queen and feeding the queen and, and uh, making sure the, the pupae are, are, or the larvae are fed and, and everything's good there. And then other ants are dealing with nest maintenance. And then there's other ants that are out foraging for food. Um, so there's really this division of labor. Um, and so they, they're all working together for, for the colony. And so why care about ants? Um, this is a, a popular um, article in, in Nature called Ants Lead Way to Speedier Computer Networks. So ants have been you know, solving problems for millions of years. And we can study ants and actually learn things that are useful um, in our, our own computer system. So ants um, have been uh, inspiring software engineers to, to think about new algorithms to, uh, to help computers. And otherwise, ants are just really abundant and they're ubiquitous. They, they occur in pretty much every terrestrial habitat. Um, they exist on all, um, on all continents except Antarctica. And, and they perform all these ecosystem services, all these important um, uh, services in the environment that, that help it kind of continue on. And, and one of those is soil turning. So you can see this Allegheny Mound Dam with a ton of soil that it's bringing up from deep underground and depositing. And um, you know, once this colony dies out, this kind of mound will, will be an important place for um, uh, plants to germinate on. And so uh, another service is waste, waste collection and nutrient cycling. Um, ants are really good at and efficient at finding uh, dead organic matter and processing that waste, consuming it, uh, and, and in doing so, really cycling nutrients in, in the uh, system. So here we have a group of ants that got really excited about this uh, dead spider carcass, and they're, they're working at it, trying to get it back to the nest to, uh, you know, maybe feed to their larvae. But, um, you know, again, kind of cycling and, and dealing with all this dead stuff that, that's all over the place, all the dead um, other insects, um, you know, they're helping with that. And then they also are kind of keystone taxa. So they're affecting plant uh, distributions, for instance, through seed dispersal. Um, there's about 11,000 plants globally that are ant dispersed. And they, what the plants have evolved is this, this lipid rich covering on their seed. It's called an eliosome. And the ants are attracted to that because it's you know good ant food. And they, they end up finding seeds with this covering and trying to bring the, the covering and the seed back to the nest. They're not so interested in the seed, they're really just interested in this, this covering. But in doing so, in, in bringing that seed and that covering away from the parent plant, they are kind of helping to disperse, helping to move the seeds away from the parent plant. And so some of our you know, favorite woodland flowers are ant dispersed, including the violets. Um, and uh, trilliums are, are ant dispersed, along with a number of other ephemeral spring uh, flowers. And there's, um, there's a conservation concern with ants. So the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has a list of threatened uh, and endangered species. And so there, this is called the red list. And there's, there's ants on that list. There, this is, these are the faces of four of the seven IUCN red listed species listed as vulnerable to extinction um, in New England. Um, and lastly, ants have really fascinating lives. Um, so the natural history is really interesting, um, including acorn dwelling ants. So we have these ants um, in the Northeast um, and they live in acorns along with uh, in other kind of cavities 
but they take advantage of empty acorns that are left by the um, acorn weevil. So this weevil as a larvae consumes all of the meat in this in the acorn. And then as it matures, it, it heads, uh, bores a hole out of this acorn, which leaves a perfect entry and exit hole for ants. And these ants take advantage of that. They have these small colonies, it's all enclosed in this acorn. Um, <clears throat> and so if we, we kind of zoom in here, we actually see that the, this is the queen. Um, so she's a bit larger than her, her, uh, her daughters. Um, and she has this kind of enlarged, uh, robust thorax. And you can see kind of where her wings were attached right here. And so that enlarged thorax uh, is housing uh, some wing muscles. And so she uses those muscles to help, um, you know, flap those wings to get her dispersed uh, uh, when she was um, after newly uh, uh, mating or uh, to, get to, um, to get to a mate using those wings and then, and then using them to go disperse to, to other sites. So those are just some characteristics that you can use to distinguish a, a queen from uh, other workers. And then you can also see the larvae in here as well. And then some of my favorite ants are these parasitic ones. Um, so there's, there's two types that I will talk about. There are additional types of parasitism in ants, but I'll talk about first the uh, temporary social parasites. And so um, people may be familiar with this ant. It's the Allegheny mound ant for Mica exectoides. Makes really conspicuous mounds. Probably the most conspicuous mounds that you'll see in our region are from this ant. Uh, and it is a temporary social parasite, which means that it um, parasitizes its host only during colony founding. So in ant um, reproduction, um, eggs that are uh, fertilized turn into either workers or queens. Um, and the workers are all female um, and, and they cannot reproduce, only queens reproduce um, in males. Um, and, and the males are, re are produced in the colony when the eggs are, are laid that are not fertilized. Um, and then you get a male. So in ant reproduction, you get a nuptial flight where the wing queens and males, you know, fly out of the nest. It's usually based on um, a cue in the environment, environmental conditions. Um, and so they go out and mate and the, the males after mating soon die. They have no other purpose. Um, <clears throat> and then this newly mated queen goes out and tries to found a nest. Well, that nest founding can be um, pretty difficult for ants. So these temporary social parasites have evolved a strategy um, where they actually infiltrate their host species nests and take it over. So in, in the Formica exectoides case, its host Formica subsericea here will pretend that this is a colony and, and will pretend that this is the queen. And that parasite comes in, a uh, parasitic queen, and, and actually infiltrates the nest of Formica subsericea and either straight up kills that queen or, you know, through some trickery kind of, kind of uh, makes uh, these worker ants think that she's the real queen and to ignore this one. Um, and so over time, you know, she's gone and you're left with the parasite and the parasites laying its own eggs, which are now being taken care of by the host species. And so this is the parasitic thing. Um, and that goes on. And as it's going on, the host is dying out because there's no queen left to replenish those workers. And, you know, these workers just keep, keep helping um, uh, help it help the parasite. Um, and so eventually, the nest has no more hosts, and it's all taken over by the parasite. And so that's the temporariness is that now once those host species are gone, um, it's not really, there's no parasitism going on anymore. Um, <clears throat> kidnapping ants. So these ants do the same thing that I just described, but they take it a step further. So instead of being just temporary, after that colony founding, they then go and have to raid 
a host species nest to steal pupae and larvae, which they which they raise and uh, do the work around the nest. And so this is uh, the scientific term for this is called dulosis. And if you come across a nest that has two distinct species in it, um, uh, you're likely have come across a, a kidnapping ant species. Um, so the this kind of lifestyle in the ants is is not that common. Only 80 species have have been known um, uh, from um, that are kidnapping ants, um, and only about half of that or a half of a percentage um, of of ant species are have this lifestyle out of the, um, I think I, I missed uh, my opportunity to talk about it, but in a slide previously, I had um, the number of ant species in the world. So there's almost, there's nearly 14,000 ant species in the world. And out of that, uh, only 80 have evolved this type of lifestyle. Um, and interestingly, this isn't, um, this isn't something that happens in the tropics. It's not known from there as of yet. It's, it only occurs in northern latitudes. So living in a temperate place, we're actually at the kind of, um, you know, the epicenter of this kidnapping activity in the ants. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a fun, uh, fun uh, thing to observe uh, if you can in the field. Um, and so this is just one, one of those kidnapping ants, uh, Formica subintegra. So how this works is that, um, at some point, the the kidnapper needs they need more host species in their in their nest, and so a scout will go out and try to locate the host nest. And when she finds it, she um, recruits her sisters, and so you end up um, you know having a raid starting, and and they try to get into the nest. Um, you know, there's some uh, skirmish going on. This they ended up decapitating this one here, um, but they the the interesting thing is that they they have these propaganda substances. So ants communicate with chemicals, uh, pheromones, and things. Um, and these propaganda substances that these kidnappers have actually um, make the host species become alarmed, and they end up dispersing away from the nest. And at the same time those substances recruit, they, they kind of uh, excite and recruit more raiders. So um, this is just a, a video. I was, I was lucky enough to, to come across some of these raids. Um, and you can see there's really no host species around. It's just the kidnappers. They're kind of leisurely um, grabbing uh, pupae and, and, and walking off with them to, to go back to their own own nest. Um, yeah, there's, so there's really no, no fighting happening um, anymore. Um, <clears throat> and then one of my favorite kidnapper ants is uh, this Amazon ant, Polyergus lucidus, which uh, is this kind of beautiful uh, ruby red. And they are completely dependent on, on their host for survival. So they have these really sharp sickle-shaped mandibles that are specialized, really specialized for uh, piercing exoskeletons um, of other ants and not, uh, they're pretty much useless for feeding, for taking care of uh, uh, brood. And so, you know, without, um, if they did not kidnap and bring back those, those uh, host species, um, they would die out. They're completely dependent. Um, so now I'll transition into ants of inland barrens of Massachusetts. Um, so just first to introduce barrens, what I'm talking about, um, these are communities that, that occur on acidic, well-drained sand or till uh, deposited from glacial outwash. So these, these occur co on the coast in the northeast, but they also occur inland. Um, so coastal pine barrens you may have heard of are New Jersey pine barrens. Um, there's pine barrens on Long Island, um, on the Cape uh, of Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Islands, but um, inland, so like Albany pine bush is an inland uh, pine barren. 
Um, but these, these systems can also occur on acidic bedrock where there's thin soils. So think about ridgetops. Um, and these are all disturbance dependent. They need disturbance to, um, to continue um, in this form. So kind of an open canopy, it needs that disturbance. It needs fire historically was important. Um, frost pockets may be important in, in some of the sand plain areas. Um, and then on these ridge tops, uh, there, there, uh, there's ice and wind that may also help keep um, the canopy open. And then pitch pine scrub oak barrens um, are a one barren type that's uh, globally imperiled. And we did look at pitch pine scrub oak barrens, but we also looked at a number of other barren types. And I'll go through some of those now. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one type, uh, rocky ridge communities. We looked at a number of these types of communities. Some of them have pitch pine, some do not. Some have scrub oak, some do not. Um, but this area, th there's pitch pine here. And another um, important characteristic of barrens is this, this heath component. So there's this understory dominance of low bush blueberry and uh, huckleberry. Um, and this particular photo actually was, um, oops, um, this is in Clarksburg State Forest um, in Massachusetts in the Northern Berkshires, um, which uh, some people may have heard that this was actually um, burning uh, this week. Um, and so I'm very curious to go up there and see if this particular spot got burned, but this, this little patch of, of pitch pine and, and heath is not very big, but that fire um, if it was through this area, will will be beneficial to this community. It may even expand it as um, some of the generalists like white pine that are not fire adapted um, will will perhaps die out um, and leave areas that that can be colonized by pitch pine and the uh, ericaceous shrubs. Um, this is just another uh, photo of a rocky ridge community. This time, there's there's not really any pitch pine at this site. Uh, it's mostly a uh, red oak group of species, um, but again, it has that ericaceous, that heath layer, <clears throat> um, mostly huckleberry here. There may be some scrub oak. Um, and then you can see there's some, uh, these brown areas are actually where mass wildlife had come in and, um, and taken out some of the white pine, um, that, that non-fire adapted species. So they're trying to, to keep this community intact by, by um, getting rid of the, the white pine because over time it will um, try to shade out some of this uh, ericaceous layer um, and, and change the community. And then power line corridors are generally um, really important uh, early successional habitat in the Northeast. So there's, an, there's a, <clears throat> some work showing that that some of these power line cuts um, have been important in the in the conservation of um, rare uh, rare animals, uh, rare invertebrates that um, are dependent on early successional habitat. And so we looked at some of these power line corridors that were on that really dry soil or on really thin soil on, on an acidic bedrock um, that had kind of the, the barren vegetation. We, we included that in our study. Um, and then heathlands. So these are open canopy areas that are dominated with low bush blueberry. <clears throat> so this is what that all is here in the foreground. Um, and this particular heathland is on a rocky substrate. So you can tell it's kind of a higher elevation site. It's on a, on a ridge top, um, not a bad place to do uh, work, um, especially when the blueberries are, are ripe. Um, and then this is a, a closed canopy um, forest. There's pitch pine in here. Uh, it's on sand plain, um, but it's, it's white pine has come in and kind of changed the system. So that ericaceous layer <clears throat> is really gone. Um, there hasn't been disturbance in here and it, it's just sitting back and waiting for disturbance to come in, open the canopy up. Um, so this is the one of the biggest threats to these these barren habitats is just lack of disturbance. So you end up getting something that looks like this, um, uh, which is 
which is going to be good for for some things, but but not for um, the specialist barren barren biota. And then the other big um, threat is development. So um, a lot of these barrens, because they're in well-drained areas, often um, along river valleys, um, they they have been subjected to a lot of development. So in my study area. Um, the Connecticut River Valley, it, that's one of the most developed areas um, in the region. And uh, it, in the past, supported um, many, many acres of barren habitat, which is now paved over. Um, and then other areas are, um, you know, there's been a lack of disturbance and it's changed or things are fragmented. Um, so that's the other kind of um, threat that, that uh, is happening. But luckily, you know, we have um, the tool of restoration. So we have, well, we have a toolbox of things to do. Um, and so conservation groups and state agencies are really interested in restoring these habitats. And they first come in and, and kind of open up the canopy and do it, um, you know, do a mechanical thinning and then eventually get prescribed fire back on the landscape. And the, with the goal really to provide habitat for the specialist barren biota. And this isn't just, you know, logging happening anywhere. It's, it's in areas that historically very likely had this type of habitat. Um, the, the soils are, are probably well-drained and super sandy, really acidic. Um, and, you know, there's just been a, a lack of disturbance for um, hundreds of years, um, or uh, at least since uh, European land abandonment. Um, and then these types of barrens, the specialists, um, biota includes things like hognose snakes. Um, this is a state, state uh, species of special concern in Massachusetts. Um, species like the pink sallow moth. This is a blueberry feeder, so it's, it's uh, caterpillars feed on blueberry. Another um, uh, Massachusetts species of special concern. Um, whippoorwills um, really like these open pine barren habitats. And then, of course, the uh, federally endangered uh, Carner Blue, um, which is extirpated in Massachusetts and it's no longer there. But luckily, um, it, it still survives and it's thriving at the Albany Pine Bush, which is um, so great to see. Um, and then there's a number of at risk ant species in barrens. So there's at least three IUCN red listed species in northeastern barrens. And there's also this recently described species. So you remember how, you know, I was talking about how little we know about the insect fauna. Um, there's still species being described. This, this species here was described just five years ago in Massachusetts. Um, it's only known from one site in Massachusetts in the world. That's the only place it, it is known to exist. Um, and it was found at a coastal pine barren, um, Miles Standish State Forest. Um, and just generally, these sites have high ant diversity. So a place like Miles Standish, which has been well sampled, um, has over half of the total New England ant fauna. So these sites in general are really important for the conservation of our region's ant species. And so our study goals and objectives were one, perform a baseline inventory of ants in lesser known barrens of inland Massachusetts, and then to better understand how management and environmental variables affect ants in these barrens. And so to do this, we, we went out in central and western Massachusetts. I did have one site uh, up in southwestern New Hampshire, um, but most of the sites were in central and western Massachusetts. And in total, we had 18 sites and 82 plots. Um, we kept plots at least 250 meters away from each other. So this is a way to try to keep our observations independent from each other. Um, it's it's one, one way of doing that. Um, and we tried to stratify the sampling. So we, we, had a, we were really interested in years since first logging. And so we had a number of categories for that. And we tried to stratify it. So we, we kind of had a balance. Um, we tried to get a similar number of plots in each of these categories so we could compare 
and see how these, these management categories are affecting the ant fauna. So we had a number of years since first logging um, categories along with uh, no management on a sandy substrate. So like those closed canopy pitch pine forests and then no management on a rocky substrate. So those kind of more uh, closed canopy um, uh, barrens on, on a, a ridge tops, for instance. Um, and then power lines we kept separate. Often these are areas that have been open for a long time. Uh, herbicide is, is usually uh, used pretty frequently to, to help keep the woody vegetation down. Um, so we kept that as a separate management uh, category. And so how we collected ants was that we set up these 75 by 75 meter plots and we, we collected ants for one person hour. We collected from ant nests. And so we have, um, we tallied kind of how many nests we were finding um, in, in the hour. And, and how we collect ants is very similar to what's going on in this photo. You just kind of look through dead wood, for instance, break it apart and, and look for ant nests look under rocks, um, look in the, the leaf litter, look on vegetation. Um, and so that's, and we tried to find as many ants as we could in that hour time. And so it's standardized for time and area searched. And then we, we wanted to collect some information on, on the environmental variables to see if any of these really uh, affected the, the ants. So we wanted information on the vegetation so we, we figured out what the percent canopy cover was in each plot. And we uh, figured out the understory vegetation structure as well using this three meter pole. You count how many times vegetation hits the pole at 0.5 meter increments. And you get kind of like a, a, a density value of how much, how dense the vegetation is in the plot. And so you take one of these uh, these data points at every seven meters along these transects in our ant sampling plot. And uh, at each one of these points, we also uh, figured out how much leaf litter there was. So we just stuck a ruler in the ground and measured how deep that, that leaf litter was. Um, and we were also interested in coarse weight debris and stumps. So this rotting uh, downwood is really important ant nest habitat. Um, and so we wanted to quantify this in our plots to see if, if that affected ants. Um, you know, does more coarse weed debris mean more ants? Um, and so how we did that was that uh, on our transects, we counted the number of uh, pieces of CWD, like, like this one here, um, how many uh, were over seven and a half centimeters in diameter. Um, if they crossed our transects, we counted them. And then for stumps, we used this two meter quadrat and counted how many stumps were in each quadrat at each one of these points. Um, and so just to go into some of the preliminary results, um, my thesis is still ongoing, but I can share some, uh, some of this preliminary uh, findings with you. Um, so, so far we have 60 species from 21 genera. And we found a, no, a number of notable county records, um, including some, some fairly um, interesting ants, um, Proceratium pergondii. Um, <clears throat> this is the only, only the second known record in Massachusetts of this ant. Um, and then a Phenogaster trite, second known inland Massachusetts record. It's more common on the coast. Um, Temnothorax americanus, um, first inland Massachusetts record, this ant is IUCN red listed as vulnerable and is actually a kidnapping ant um, that kidnaps those acorn ants. Um, and so before I talk about those ants, I wanna talk a little bit about Temnothorax shamii. Um, this ant is, is kind of unique in the Northeast because it's arboreal. So we do have some arboreal ants, but the majority of our ants are ground dwelling. Um, and this ant uh, likes to nest under the bark of oaks, especially large white oaks and pitch pine. So I found this ant only at Montague Plains, um, a, a big uh, inland pine barren in uh, 
Western Massachusetts, um, that was the only site that I found this ant at. And it, I found it um, nesting in the pitch pine bark. So with pretty um, good consistency, if I looked at a pitch pine that was, you know, maybe about a foot in diameter, if I looked at it at my eye level, uh, and if that pitch pine was in the open, if it was, didn't, uh, wasn't in a closed canopy, um, I would eventually see these ants foraging on the trunk. And so this particular um, photo, there's actually a nest here. The ants had kind of retreated, but they left some of their larvae. Um, and the pitch pine, as, as some of you know, um, is really is fire adapted. And so it has this really thick, um, chunky bark that kind of flakes off. And so you can just go up to some of these pitch pines and, and you know, break off some of the bark pieces and see if you find um, this ant nesting there. Interestingly, I didn't find it in closed canopy areas that had pitch pine. I only found it in open canopy areas. Not to say that it's not in the closed canopy. It could just be higher up in, in the canopy um, where there might be more sunlight. I, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it was pretty interesting and, and nice to see that um, the management may be helping this ant in particular at Montague by opening up the canopy. Um, and I was finding it quite, uh, it, quite common at that site, but not at, at any others. Um, talking about Proceratium pergondii, this is a really interesting species. It's actually a specialized predator on spider eggs. Um, and in, uh, in the US, it's not this isn't necessarily a rare ant in the region in the um, in the eastern U.S. It's fairly widespread, but if we go up to the northeast, it it kind of drops off. It it gets rarer as you kind of go up here. Um, you know, this might be the New Jersey pine barrens or something, and you get some on Long Island, but really in New England and upstate New York, it's nearly non-existent. You got one spot here in Connecticut. And then Massachusetts is lit up. So all of these maps um, are coming from antmap.org, which is a great resource. You can go on and map the distributions of any ant species you want. Um, and, and what the dots mean is that there's actually a physical specimen that is housed in a museum um, and it's been, it's been recorded. Um, when there's not a dot and the state is lit up, it just, it means there's no physical specimen, but there's a, a record in the literature only. And so I was digging around and found this um, paper published in 1958 um, by William Brown, who is or, or was one of E.O. Wilson's mentors. Um, and he found this ant at Great Blue Hill, um, just south of Boston and has it as the most northeasterly record for the species. Um, so this is where that record came from. Um, and if we zoom in here to, to, uh, to southern New England, we've got Brown's record here at Great Blue Hill. And we've got this New Haven record, which is an undated specimen um, from West Rock Park. It, it may be a pretty old specimen, but I'm not sure. Um, and then we've got our record from last year. So this ant in Massachusetts hadn't been seen since Brown um, over 50 years ago. So this was a pretty exciting find. And it does seem like this is the kind of northern extent of this, this species range. It doesn't, it's never been collected north of this area. Um, so that's interesting. And what all of these spots have in common is that they're all on ridges that support some sort of rocky, um, rocky ridge community. Um, <clears throat> so there is pitch pine scrub oak uh, on this ridge. Um, Great Blue Hill has pitch pine scrub oak in places, but um, West Rock Park, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's a little bit more of a richer site, but it does have these kind of open, um, dry woodlands that are, that are um, you know, fire adapted and probably fire influenced. Um, so that's pretty interesting. All of these have that in common. There's kind of this dry woodland aspect to all of these. Um, and just in general, um, con conserving um, species at the range limit is, is really important. 
Um, there may be kind of genetic adaptations that the individuals have here that um, allow them to live in a bit of a different environment than the, the species or the um, individuals of the species that exist um, in the heart of its range and more in the south. Um, and especially in a, in a rapidly changing climate, um, these range edge species um, um, will be important to conserve as, as um, things change. Um, we want to try to facilitate any movement north that needs to happen. Um, and one way to, to do that is just to um, ensure that these populations persist and to identify um, where else they might be, might be um, present. So looking at some other ridgetops with this kind of community um, in, in more of this area would be good. Um, and then another ant, a phenogaster trite. So this is restricted to sandy soils in open habitats. The previous Massachusetts distribution was mostly on the Cape um, and the Massachusetts islands, but inland, um, pretty rare. Uh, if we look at the map again, like the previous ant, not rare, you know, in the US, it's fairly widespread in east of the Rockies. Um, but in, in the Northeast, um, it kind of drops out around, um, you know, the Vermont border, um, though it is showing up in, in Maine here. Um, this is the Albany pine bush. Um, we've got New Jersey pine barrens, Long Island with pine barrens. Um, and then uh, this is actually Montague Plains, but it's a record from 2000. So we had over 20 sampling plots at Montague and we did not find the species there. Um, we did find it on a power line in Hampton County. Um, and it, we found it occurring with some other um, sandy soil ants of barrens. So Fidole pilifera and Nylandaria um, parvula. And to me, um, from the ant perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this is kind of indicating a, a high integrity site. So you have some of these, these um, barren specialist ants that are, that are really need the, the super dry, droughty conditions. And, and to me, it, it seems likely that those conditions have persisted here for a long time um, to allow these ants to persist. And so the other interesting thing is, is that this is in Hampton County. It's actually, it's in Palmer, um, but this was, you know, previously not really thought of as a as a place that had barrens. Yet um, we're we're seeing kind of a pretty high quality site that that also supports a number of other uh, rare uh, invertebrates. Um, so I'll I'm going to jump a little bit. I've talked about Montague Plains a bit, but I'm going to jump in a little bit more into that site, and that is located here in Franklin County. Um, it's just north of Amherst, so Amherst is uh, in Hampshire County somewhere, um, and it's it's this site is just uh, east of the Connecticut River. Um, it's really Massachusetts' most well-known, largest inland pitch pine scrub oak barren, and there's a, been a lot of management done here over the last 20 years, and I'm just gonna. Um, look at a very small subset of my sampling plots to, to uh, illustrate a few patterns that we're seeing. So I've got kind of three management blocks here. So there's the purple um, polygons that um, this has a closed canopy forest. And then we have this kind of orange polygon that has um, an area that, that's been managed for 13 years. And then this blue or teal polygon um, is, is an area that's been managed for only four years. And so this is a map showing ant diversity with more diverse plots being red and, and a lower diversity having green. And so we can look at the averages in these management zones and we see that the the area that's been managed for a long time, for 13 years, has more species than the closed canopy forest and the, the area that's been managed for just four years. And so this is um, 
This is um, interesting to me. It's kind of uh, what we would expect. Um, usually open canopy areas have more higher ant diversity compared to closed areas. And then ants are, are um, pretty sensitive to disturbance. So we would, we would, um, we had hypothesized that, um, you know, uh, only a few years after, after management, um, that ant, the ant fauna would still kind of be recovering and, and changing um, after just four years. But it seems like after 13 years or so, um, um, the, the diversity is pretty high. Um, almost 13 species for a single plot um, to, to find that many species in one hour um, is, is, that's pretty good. That's, that's quite a few ant species. Um, if we look at ant abundance, so same thing, red being more ant nests, green being fewer, um, and uh, you know we can you know we can ask the question: Is there any pattern here? Um, it definitely looks different. Um, we can put those averages up again, and it's and they're really the same. There, there's not any difference between the three different management types, and so this was. Um, somewhat surprising to me, I kind of thought that the, the abundance would follow the diversity, that we would have fewer ants in the closed camp or fewer ant nests in the closed campy versus the open campy. Um, but having them be about the same was, was pretty interesting. Um, and so, uh, um, yeah, that's kind of unexpected. Um, and so if we look at this graph, and now this is looking at my entire study area, so all sites, not just Montague, um, and it's looking at nest count, so nest abundance, with the management uh, categories. And just like kind of what I showed you on the map, um, the four to seven years, uh, managed for four to seven years, um, Kind of rebounds at that point. That nest abundance goes goes up, but before that, one to three years after uh, management, after kind of initial logging, that the ant abundance takes a, a pretty big hit, a significant hit. And, you know, it's it's changing over from a kind of forest species, um, and now those forest species um, are moving on moving uh, and then you get the open habitat species coming in and, and increasing the abundance. Um, and so we, we, this seems to show us that the, the ant um, abundance rebounds after about four years. Um, again, this is not diversity. Um, that will be, um, that's an ongoing um, analysis. Um, and then we, we can look at a few different environmental variables that affect ants. So we found that vegetation structure under 1.5 meters. So this is kind of underneath, um, you know, kind of the understory vegetation from ground level to, um, to 1.5 meters. Um, as that density of vegetation in that area increases, so does ant nest abundance. And so that was one um, important environmental variable we found that affects uh, the number of ant nests. And the other one was leaf litter depth. So as leaf litter depth increases, we see an increase in ant abundance or yes, ant nest abundance. Um, and so just to summarize some of that, um, we found that the initial impacts from logging disturbance are significant for up to three years, but after three years, the difference between those categories, so um, the difference between four to seven years post-logging compared to a, a non-logged um, closed canopy forest were not um, different. They were not statistically different. Um, there was no discernible uh, difference. Um, and then with the ant abundance, with the environmental variables, we found an increase um, in ant abundance with increased understory structure. And uh, um, in Albany, uh, Grace Barber studied the ant fauna at Albany Pine Bush and found a somewhat similar um, uh, relationship, but with ant diversity. So she found higher ant species density in shrublands versus grasslands. Um, and then our, our higher ant abundance with increased leaf liver depth 
Um, this may be related to increases in other soil arthropods, other leaf litter arthropods. This could be um, ant food. Um, this may also be the mechanism for why we're seeing an increase in ant nests with increased vegetation structure. So you have kind of more ant or uh, plant biomass, which is supporting more insects, more energy available, more resources, um, and that could could help uh, increase um, ant abundance. Um, but the question for us going forward is, is really, will diversity follow this pattern? Or are these variables just increasing the generalist species abundance? Um, and I think from just looking at what I showed you at, at um, Montague, it seems that um, the, the, um, we may see a similar pattern to what Grace Barber saw at Albany where those shrublands, maybe not as dense as this, but um, that definitely some understory vegetation is going to help in increasing ant diversity. Um, so the pattern may not be so much um, linear like this, but it may be more curved. So we may see um, kind of uh, at, with not much understory, we, we, we may see fewer ant diversity, but then as, as that increases, it might hit an asymptote somewhere and peak, and then it might decrease as, as you're getting um, even more, but um, we'll have to wait for that. Um, and then with the, the uh, discussion for diversity, not much work had been done on ants of rocky barrens. Um, and so we found some, some rare and threatened ant species on rocky barrens. And so we, we feel that both rocky and sandy soil barrens are important habitat for rare and threatened ant species and, and should be um, um, conserved and, and managed. Um, sandy soil specialists, we had at one site indicating at, at least one high integrity barren site. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, again, interesting because it, it was previously not really thought of as a, as a barren site, um, but it being high integrity and, and having those unique um, species, it will be really great to increase the habitat there. Um, and then think about kind of connectivity between that high integrity site and some of the other Barron's restoration sites. So we want to help facilitate dispersal of these specialists to other restoration sites. And one way you can do that is to think about like a stepping stone sites. So places kind of in between that would work um, and help kind of facilitate the, uh, the, their dispersal. Because insects in general, um, especially ants, um, may, may have a hard time uh, dispersing. Um, and so that's all I have. I want to acknowledge um, some, some of my funding support. So I had some support from Antioch, um, as well as Mass Wildlife supported some of the vegetation uh, data collection. And then I had a, a bunch of great field and lab support from, from a number of folks at Antioch. And then I, I want to acknowledge the different land managing organizations that have um, that let us do research on their land. Um, and with that, I will um, take any questions. Um, again, this is my email, so feel free to um, email me with anything. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kyle. That was super, super interesting. Um, I really liked how you told different stories about the different types of ants. Um, and I have some interesting questions. Um, I just want to remind if anybody has a question, you can type it into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, and we'll start with Richard had a question. Do the Indian tribes you work with do any of any burning? And I also wonder if they have lost some of the knowledge about using fire as a tool. Yeah, so um... We are not working with any of the native tribes. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, um, their traditional homelands that, that we were working on, but definitely um, native peoples manage these, these areas with fire. Um, and, and yes, I, I'm not sure um, kind of as far as how much um, information has been lost, but I'm sure there's, there's been a ton of ecological knowledge that's, that's been lost. Um, 
but I, I'm, I'm excited to see things like land acknowledgements being, being more common. Um, and, and I hope that, that we can start um, facilitating um, conversations with, with Native peoples and really learn about, about um, how, how they were and how they are still managing um, some of these areas. Because I think it, it will be a benefit to, to, um, to everyone, and including these, these um, insects and, and other wildlife. Awesome. And then I think a couple of us had maybe a, a similar question. Um, so on your graph, you show that there's increasing nest abundance with increasing leaf litter. Um, now that is one thing that fire really removes, right? Mm -hmm. right. So would mm -hmm. question, you know, like in these sites that seem to really facilitate high ant abundance and possibly diversity, how is that impacted by fire? And um, April asks, how do the ants survive the fires? Yeah, um, great observation and question. Um, yeah, so what we'll have to wait for <laughs> when I get my analyses done um, is, is how does the diversity, um, how is the diversity actually affected by the leaf litter? Um, I kind of had the hypothesis that it, that opposite of what we were seeing with the abundance, I, I thought that diversity would probably increase with, with less um, leaf litter because um, the leaf litter is kind of really mesifying, it's kind of moistening the environment. And, and so you're not really, probably not getting the specialist ants that really depend on the droughty, dry conditions um, if that leaf litter is there. Um, yeah, so it, it's going to have to wait, unfortunately. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and uh, I think maybe some of it with the abundance. Um, yeah, it, like I showed the map where the closed canopy had just as many ant nests as the managed areas. And so I think, yeah, that's just kind of, um, it may be ant abundance is the same, uh, no matter kind of what the leaf litter depth is, but the diversity may be very different, um, but we'll have to wait. And then um, the question about uh, how do ants deal with fire? Um, yeah, um, so luckily a number of ants nest in the ground, so they could probably just quickly, you know, go underground and, and probably not be too harmed. Um, but as far as other ants kind of nesting in, um, well, nesting in, in coarse weed debris, it may just be moist enough in that, in that downwood that it doesn't burn because hopefully, you know, the fires aren't going to be super, um, you know, big and, and robust fires or kind of just ground fires that, that don't necessarily burn everything. Um, so I feel like the, a lot of the downwood would, would stay intact, at least somewhat, and, and they may be able to deal with it. Um, some species will move their nests based on disturbance, so that could also be an option for some. Interesting. Um, Jeremy says, Kyle, great presentation. As an ant keeper and enthusiast in Albany, I'm blown away by the diversity in the barrens. Do you have a favorite species or one that has really stood out to you in your research? Um, great uh, to have another ant enthusiast on the, on the uh, talk here. Um, yeah, a favorite ant species. I mean, I'm, I'm particular to kind of the rare stuff. Um, so I like um, a phenogaster trite was one that I expected to find and I was very excited to finally find it after I thought it would be at Montague and it wasn't. And so finding it um, and it was just at one site. Um, and then otherwise, um, if you know the Fidole pilifera, these are like the big headed ants. So they have their um, major workers, the larger workers have massive heads. I mean, like ridiculously sized heads, and they look, you know, crazy. And and those are those are always fun um, to see. Um, I didn't find as many of, of those as I thought I would, but um, yeah, those are probably two of my favorite. 
other than um, the parasitic um, kidnapping ants I, I like as well, um, that Polyergus lucidus, that, that ruby red ant. Um, another one I was hoping to find, but, but we didn't, um, but those are really cool too. Awesome. Um, Karen asks, morphological question, what are the little holes on top of their heads? Oh, um, I think you're talking about the ocelli, um, like here. So those are simple eyes and they, they probably help, um, I believe they help in kind of detecting light kind of changes. Um, so it gives them a bit, uh, you know, if, if there's a shadow coming over above them, like, like me with my camera, um, they would be able to probably uh, perceive that. I think, I think that's, I think that's a good call. That's probably what she means. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, April and Jeremy actually both asked if you have um, encountered any invasive species um, in the area or in Pine Barrens in particular. Um, great question. Um, we only found one non-native species. It's not, as of now, it's not really considered invasive, um, but it's the uh, pavement ants, which you may have seen in your sidewalks this spring having these territorial battles, but um, they're pretty common in uh, any kind of disturbed area. Um, in, invasive ants, in, as far as in New York and Massachusetts in general, there are a number of them. Um, one is the European fire ant, Mermica rubra. Um, that one will sting people, um, and it, it, but it's more, um, I guess it has been collected in Berkshire County. Um, we didn't find it, but it's, it's definitely more common kind of in, in Eastern Mass. Um, it's, I would assume it's in like on Long Island. Um, and then New York City, I'm sure, has all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> there, there was a paper that looked at the ant fauna of, of New York City medians, um, but I forget exactly um, what species they found. But um, yeah, there's things like Asian needle ant that's kind of more southern that's probably creeping up. Um, there's some island area that's, uh, you know, in eastern mass that's, that's non-native. Um, so yeah. But luckily, those... sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, um, luckily, in Barrens, um, because they're they're so um, so droughty and and uh, and it, it really, if the management is right and those con those soil conditions are are really barren, like um, it it you're probably not going to find. Um, too many invasives. I mean, that's at least the case with a lot of the plants. You're, you're not seeing a whole lot of invasives come in after management. Um, it's just it's just too, um, you know, kind of extreme. I was going to ask if any of those non-native species um, are they invasive in that they're pushing out native ones or replacing native species. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's been a quite a bit of work on Mermica rubra, the European fire ant, and they did find kind of a displacement um, of, of native ants. And uh, pavement ant may do that. Um, I'm not quite up on, on the literature of the invasive ants, um, but definitely, probably to some extent. Yeah. Um, Scott and Denise are, said, fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, what photo equipment do you use for your in-habitat close-up images? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I shoot a Canon um, DSLR. I use a 100 millimeter macro lens <laughs> with a, um, a extension tubes. So that's, I don't have the like super um, super magnifying macro lens. I, I just use the extension tubes on a hundred millimeter. Um, but I, that's, um, I was able to get this shot and then I use a flash, kind of a dual head flash. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Geeky. They, um, they run, uh, they have a, they have a photography business. Uh, 
So, and well, they do some amazing um, photography in the preserve. So, <laughs> well, yeah, we um, can uh, nerd out on camera gear <laughs> all the <another> time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had a quick question about your, the, the management of your site. So you said it was 13 and four years um, since management. So were the sites not actively managed in that 13 years? Yeah, um, good question. Um, the site that was, um, the 13 years was since first management. And then that 13, that block that was in the 13 year one, it did have a mowing. It, it had an initial logging and mowing, and then it had a logging or a, another mowing like five, six years ago or something. Okay. Um, and the other one that was four years there, four years was the initial logging and mowing. And then um, they did have some herbicide in there on the stump sprouts last or uh, two years ago. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. We, we, we will look at um, some of those, um, of, or we might be throwing some of that into our models, the, uh, the last treatment time versus the first treatment, um, add that in as well. Gotcha. Yeah, I was curious because they are disturbance-dependent habitats, so I was curious if it was successing that whole 13 years or if it was actively being managed to keep it. Mm -hmm. kind of open. Um, let's see, Jeremy says, this question may be to our friends at the preserve, but as flights are beginning in upstate New York, are we allowed to take specimens from the preserve? And he says, thank you again. Um, Jeremy, technically you do need a permit to take um, insects. Actually, I think that's just a New York state rule um, to take any specimens in New York state, you do need a permit, um, but you can always shoot me uh, an email. I'll put it down here in the chat and um, we can look into getting you a permit, um, especially if you're willing to share what you learn. Um, so here's my email address. Okay. Yeah, and, and all of our work was was also permitted. Um, we had permits from Mass Wildlife, uh, statewide collecting permits, and permits from um, you know different land um, uh, managing organizations like DCR. We had our own permit through them and, and uh, like Mass Autobahn, we had a permit. Um, so that's that's definitely the, the way to go. And it looks like April has another question. Where do ants stay when there is a downpour or local flooding? Um, yeah, I'm, again, they probably can go, the ones that nest in soil can probably go underground and, and they probably have a way uh, in their in their nest that they create space that won't get flooded. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure. I mean, as far as things that are nesting like in leaf litter, um, one thing you'll see in wetlands is that there are ants in wetlands, but they tend to be on the hummocks. So the sedge hummocks above um, you know, probably just above the, the, wherever the water line goes, the water line probably doesn't go that high. And so they're pretty safe. Or there's, there's a species that makes um, pretty big mounds in wetlands. And so again, it's, it's just a way to kind of stay above the water. Um, you may have heard of the um, uh, southern fire ant, Solenopsis invicta, invasive in the southeast. Um, that ant uh, evolved and is from the uh, Amazon region and actually creates rafts. So it, it, it's dealt, it deals with flooding. And so it, it will create rafts where it, it, they kind of, the workers kind of latch onto each other and, and, and float themselves um, around in flooded conditions. So that's one really interesting um, adaptation that, that um, you can read more about. But that was a problem, ended up being a problem like in the hurricane flooding in, in Texas and stuff a few years ago. You know, it was like, do not touch a floating mass of, uh, you know, black mass because it's going to be these, these uh, fire ants. Um. You got to add, you got to put something on top of having to deal with flooding. Now you've got floating fire ants. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kyle, I just had one more question for you. And since you cited Grace's work, I was curious if you found any um, any ants in common between what she found here at the Pine Bush and what you saw in your barrens. Yeah, um, 
Um, definitely a fumigaster trite showed up at, at, at in my well in one of my sites, and it it is at the pine bush. Um, Temnothorax shamii, that arboreal ant, was found at the pine bush. Um, also found at at Montague Plains. Um, but there's a, a ton of, of overlap. Um, we didn't have uh, Grace found Forelius prunosus. That was kind of a, a northern record for the species that um, we didn't find that. Um, but yeah, a lot of overlap. Um, you end up getting kind of a mixture of both kind of forest species and open habitat species in these pine barrens because there's there's such a mosaic of habitats. There's everything from grasslands to shrublands to the closed canopy. And so in a small area, that's that um, kind of heterogeneity is, is definitely helping increase ant species. So um, yeah, I think Grace had, you know, over 50 species for the pine barren for Albany pine bush, which is great. I think we're we're probably about at that as well for Montague. Awesome. So yeah, do you think, it sounds like you kind of think these barrens might be hot spots. I know certainly entomologists have been visiting pine barrens for a long time, but I think my understanding that was largely due to moths and butterflies, but it sounds like maybe they're hot spots for a lot of insects. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, the super high ant diversity um, for sure. Um, yeah, it's ants are kind of thermophilic they they do kind of like kind of hotter conditions they tend to be more diverse in in open hotter environments so um and that's a lot of what pine barrens are hot open <laughs> environments <laughs> yep which yep <laughs> we know from experience <laughs> well thank you so very much kyle this was a really engaging and very interesting talk so we super appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight um and thank you everyone so much for joining us yeah thanks dylan and, and thanks everyone all right have a good night everybody all right take care